All right, well, hello, my name is Jordan Musser and I'm a senior here at Frisco High School and I'm an ISM1 student and this year I'm studying speech language pathology. So I thought I'd open up my presentation with my quote. Um, my quote is by Dr. Richard T. Mayoto and it is, uh, one day our patients will be able to tell their own stories and we'll no longer have to convince naysayers that deaf children can listen and speak. And I chose this quote because I think it's really inspiring as wanting to work with deaf kids to prove to everybody that they can do more, they can listen and they can speak and they can live in the real society um, compared to what it used to be where um, deaf kids were called dumb and couldn't do anything. So I think this is a really inspiring quote, so that's why I chose it for this year. So before I get into my topic, I thought I'd tell y'all a little bit about me. So I said I'm a senior here. I have two younger brothers. Um, even though I'm the smallest, they're definitely younger than me. Jared is a freshman, he's the taller one, and Jack is in seventh grade. And this year I was also, um, oh, I forgot to turn my clock, oh well. Um, and I'm also the JV captain this year of my cross country team. I've been running cross country since I was in seventh grade. I absolutely love my team. I am so sad that season's over. And I'm also um, the varsity manager this year. I decided not to play soccer due to outsiding factors and um, my coaches were not interested in having me leave. So they asked me if I wanted to be the manager. So I accepted that offer. And so now I'm the varsity manager. Um, my family were really big in scouting, we're really big in being outside, and so I'm actually a Girl Scout. Um, there's a statistic out there that says for every 100 boys that will get their Eagle Project, only one girl will get their gold, and for some reason that really inspired me, so I wanted to get my Girl Scout Gold Project. So this is a picture of my Girl Scout Gold Project. Wait. That. So I basically created an exhibit about cochlear implants at the Pro Museum in Dallas, and it stayed there for about 10 weeks, and around 50,000 people had the opportunity to see my project. Um, in action. So if you can see, I have, these are old uh, cochlear implants, they're really big. And then in the very back corner, you can't see that, but I have um, like new, brand new cochlear implants. So you can really see the technology change in that. You can see my story and um, what inspired me and why I'm interested in this. You can see how it works. And then there's a video, it's a six minute video um, where I had the opportunity to interview three professionals in their field, an otolaryngologist, which is just a really fancy word for a surgeon, a speech pathologist, and an audiologist. And they're all really top of their field and were absolutely amazing and wonderful to meet with. I learned so much and they really inspired me to continue, um, continue working towards my goal of becoming a speech pathologist. So for my project, I volunteered about 40 hours at the museum, as you can see in this, and I answered questions and I met people and other scouts and people who were thinking about actually implanting their kids, which I thought was really cool because I'm hopefully I encouraged them and showed them that this is a wonderful technology and it should be shared and everyone should at least look into this if they have that option. Um, I did have one really negative thing come up, but I will tell you all about that when I get to um, Cochlear Implants vs. Deaf Community. And then I also had the opportunity to work at the Hearing and Listening Camp for children who work cochlear implants over the summer. This is part of my project. Um, the speech pathologist that I interviewed invited me to come work at this camp. So this camp is a summer class for graduate students and basically their final product was to create camp activities um, for any age group and they had the opportunity to work with this group. So I thought it was really cool that um, the groups weren't aged by levels of speech. They were aged um, by their age. That's how they were put into their groups. So you can see the difference of the kids who were implanted really, really young and they have amazing speech and then the kids who just got it implanted and can barely even talk, don't have a lot of confidence um, and rely on sign language. So I thought it was really cool just to see the difference. Um, I had so much fun at this camp. They, these kids were so amazing. And I was the only one who actually knew sign language. So for the two um, that did not know almost any English um, and how to communicate, I was their like, little helper and I thought it was really a lot of fun. All right, so this is my inspiration for why I wanna do this. My, uh, my little brother is actually deaf and wears bilateral cochlear implants. He lost his hearing at 13 months to meningitis and was implanted on his right at 16 months and on his left at three years old, and he's an amazing kid. Um, he just got mainstreamed back into his normal middle school and so no longer has to go to the regional day school for the deaf. He is playing soccer, he's involved in scouts, he's a pain sometimes because he's very sassy, um, but he has so much confidence in himself and without years, of, years and years of speech, um, he would not be who he was today. So I think it's really amazing how speech can change a person's life. So this is my little brother. He's now 13 and taller than me. So 
Oh, this is a video I have, so um, I want you all to listen to how these girls talk. So they were both born deaf, but after years of speech therapy, you can't even tell that they're deaf. So do I just click on this? With... Oh, okay. If it works. When you first have a child, especially your firstborn, you kind of want to have that baby blip. I remember when Callie would wake up in the night and I would go into her room and she'd be crying like any baby does. And I would pick her up and I remember sometimes being very challenged to sing to her because I was going through all of these emotions that, well, she can't hear me anyway. So what's the point? And I just remember that sense of loss of how am I going to make this baby feel love when she can't hear me. The day she got her ears turned on, her eyes, from the minute the first sound that was the first beeps that even went into her ears, her eyes just, she just lit right up and she looked right at us. Those little eyes just got so sparkly. <laughs> I saw a video of that um, when we first got them turned on and we had all these toys and stuff and I was pushing over which my toys and so loud and stuff and yeah. I remember my husband and I looked at each other and, and uh, I think we just kind of knew that, that it was probably the same scenario as well for Lexi. We knew without a doubt as soon as her hearing loss progressed to the point of being a cochlear implant candidate, 100% for sure she was getting a cochlear I mean, we all face those fears of putting your baby through surgery and all of those kind of things. And it was emotional. It was tough for us to go through. And from that first moment, it was confirmed that they could hear us. And it was just such a joyful feeling. And we knew we had done the right thing. Our teacher, one day, she told us that there was a miracle in our classroom because of me, my, my hearing. Our lives are completely changed. They wouldn't hit. It just wouldn't be the same. They can hear us. So, sorry. <laughs> They're going to be embarrassed. <laughs> So now, how do I get it? Do I go to PowerPoint? This one? Cool. Okay, so um, if you guys could notice in there, those girls sound almost completely, they don't sound like they're deaf at all. You, I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, that's just explaining about cochlear implants. Okay, well, you can keep your mouse now because I don't need it anymore. That's just explaining cochlear implants. So, all right, so as you can see, um, both these girls have really amazing speech. Um, you can't really tell that they're deaf. Usually, if you wear hearing aids, that you have the deaf, or you have a deaf sound with you, or you can tell that they're deaf or have a hearing loss, but with cochlear implants, you can't really even notice um, that anymore because of how technology has changed. It really is a bionic ear. And so it's all internal and is, you have to have surgery to get cochlear implants, but it's really amazing how speech can change that whole thing. So I thought I would talk about why I wanted to do ISM. So I was inspired by my friend Gracie Carl, who I'm actually going to school with next year, which I'm really excited, um, in American Sign Language. We took three years of American Sign Language together, and she always talked about how um, she was studying nursing, how nursing, having this class where she could learn more about nursing was so amazing to her, that she was able to have a class that really meant something to her, and I thought that was so awesome. So I thought, well, I want to have a class that means something to me. So, and I also wanted to gain some real world experience and actually learn how to write professional letters and learn how to interview people because I have, would have no idea how to do that. And I also wanted to step out of my comfort zone a little bit. I'm not, I hate public speaking. I'm not the person who would be comfortable standing up here and giving a 25 minute speech. And also calling people on the phone and just interacting with people I've never met before, that is 
a little nerve-wracking to me, so this is a, I thought this would be a really great way to step out of my comfort zone and try some new things. So, as you can see, I had a lot of really basic, actually advanced, I guess, knowledge about everything. I knew a lot about this field from the beginning. So I did some really random um, research assessments at the beginning. So I uh, did an early hearing detection and intervention test, which is the mandatory test that you take, um, that newborns have to take uh, before they leave the hospital. I'm pretty sure it's law in almost every state. And then I did a, a research assessment about cochlear implants versus deaf community. As you can see in this picture with the propaganda, this is from a um, deaf newspaper and I am, got very heated during this thing. This is something that I have a difficult time um, with, um, with other people. As I said with my Girl Scout project, um, something really negative came out of that. A older woman from who was not in the deaf community but was like related to the deaf community approached me while I was working down there by myself and was like not verbally attacking but like yelling at me because my beliefs are wrong and was like you are I can't believe you're doing this you're hurting our culture but she wasn't involved in the culture so I don't really understand that but um, it got to the point where I had to go get security because I felt so uncomfortable and not safe in my area so I thought that was really weird that they're so against this, but I totally respect their culture. I took three years of American Sign Language. I know their culture. I understand um, why they believe this, but I just think it's very, very weird. They think that we are taking away from their culture by um, doing cochlear implants because they don't get to experience the deaf life and um, the language. And I think if my child was deaf and I had this option, I would take it in a heartbeat so I can give my child every opportunity that I can. So that was a very interesting experience and then I also did a research assessment over the areas you can work. You can work in clinics, hospitals, schools, and private practice. Um, hospitals didn't really appeal to me because I do not like hospitals very much um, and that's not towards death, that's more towards um, people who have gone through stroke, uh, strokes or car accidents and then private practice is a lot of responsibility and a lot of money that you have to give up or use to uh, fund your whole practice. So schools and clinics really interested me. So I did, mo I did a research assessment on clinical research and I interviewed four clinicians at UTD Callier Center. Um, some things that I learned about was um, ABT or auditory verbal therapy. This is a um, certification. It's a three to five year process that you have to go through if you want to be a clinician, um, which I thought was really weird. You would think after going um, through your undergrad and getting a master's in um, speech pathology that you wouldn't have to do even more certification, but you do. Um, you also have to find all your own patients and you're paid per, um, per patient instead of a yearly salary. And then it's also more family oriented. You're teaching um, your families how to work with their kids at home more than working with the kids. And But a great thing is you get to work as a team, especially at UTD Callier Center. There's a ton of audiologists and a ton of speech pathologists there of all different ranges who are there to support you and help you. So I really, really like that aspect. So my very first interview was with Melissa Sweeney. She's the head of the Coker Implant Program at the UTD Callier Center of Communication Disorders. Um, she's amazing. She is no longer a practicing speech pathologist. She teaches graduate students and just overlooks the whole program. And she's also the director of the hearing and listening camp um, that I worked at over the summer. I interviewed her for my Girl Scout project, so I got to know her really well. So this was a very comfortable, very first choice I did for my interviews. My next interview is with Amber Selick. She works at UTD Callier Center. She works with kids three to 10 uh, with cochlear implants and she's currently working on her ABT. I think she's in her third year of it. And she wants to become a bilingual speech pathologist, which I thought was really cool because we do live in Dallas, which is like the melting pot of um, the nation. And there's so many different ethnicities here. And I thought it was really cool that she wants to learn another language so she can take on more students and help more kids. And she also graduated from SFA, which is where I'm going this fall, so. Um, my next interview is with Erica Brown, and she also works at the UTD Calgary Center. She actually works at the Dallas location instead of the Richardson location, so that drive was terrifying because I had to drive all the way downtown, but it was a lot of fun um, interviewing her. She works with um, children 3 to 10, and she also works with adults with cochlear implants, which is really cool. Uh, you don't see a lot of adults with cochlear implants, especially if they were born deaf and then got cochlear implants, um, because there's not a lot of progress that you can be made. Um, most children get implanted so young, like under one years old because they have that whole time to let their brain develop with the cochlear implant. And a lot of adults, they totally miss that window of having brain development. So when they get their implant so late, 
there's not a lot of progress being made because it takes so long for the brain to function and to try to figure out all the new sounds and everything. So she said that working with adults is really easy because there's not a lot of paperwork. You always do the same thing, but there's, it's not as fun because you don't get to see like any progress in the adults. And then she also previously worked in a school district environment and kind of inspired me to maybe go check out um, the school district like area. I wasn't really interested in it, but I thought I might give it a try. So she was really great to interview. And then my next interview is with Hannah Prochet. She also works at the Callier Center. She's currently working on her PhD in hearing sciences. Um, she's the only speech pathologist tr working towards her PhD. Um, she wants to be able to combine audiology and speech pathology. So audiology is the very technical and hands-on part of dealing with the processors of the cochlear implants and um, doing the mapping to make sure all the sounds are correctly. Um, with a cochlear implant, you have electrodes that are um, put into your cochlea. It's like a little the snail part and um, those could send electric, um, like not shocks, through the cochlea almost. And um, if you have those off or they're not placed right or they're too strong, they can hurt and become very uncomfortable. So that's their job as they are there to um, make sure every, that this uh, patient is comfortable and is there to make sure that all the equipment is working correctly. And so she wanted to combine that part of this area and speech pathology, that's the goal of her PhD. And she wants to combine those because she couldn't really figure out what she wanted to do. And then she also works with uh, students 5 to 10, but she no longer sees as many students as she used to because she's currently working on her PhD and going to classes and everything like that. So then my next like big area of research, I did the school research. So every school is different. But I did all my interviews at Davis Elementary School. It's in Plano. It has a regional day school in, for the deaf in it. There's about 75 kids outside of that district that are busted in every day to go to the regional day school for the deaf. This is where my brother went for two years and he loved it. Um, so when you're working at this school, you see about 30 to 45 kids a week and you have a really good connection with your kids. You don't do it with parents so much and it's more one-on-one -on -one time with your uh, students or your small groups. And there's a big family sense within the school, especially at Davis, because there's such a large deaf community. So you have multiple deaf speech language pathologists and um, special education teachers and uh, deaf education teachers. So I thought that was really cool. But one, like, not negative, but one, like, bad hardship thing is you have to deal with the art and the special education processes and the education law so that's a lot of paperwork you spend a lot of time in meetings a lot of time writing um, IEPs and everything so but I was really interested so my next interview is with Amanda Amanda England she works at Davis Elementary School she's a deaf education speech pathologist and she works with kindergartners to fifth grade and she sees about 45 kids a week and that seems like a lot um, typical speech test speech shit oh my gosh speech sessions are um, 30 minutes long and you usually have them about twice a week. And my next interview was with Casey Murray. She also works at Davis Elementary School, but she's a special education and deaf education speech therapist. So she does both. Um, the deaf education students that she does see have m multiple um, other conditions that they need to see specifically her because she's more special education. Um, but the thing that I thought was really interesting was she has a deaf brother and so we had that whole like connection. Um, he does not have cochlear implants. He um, stuck to sign language. He didn't have those opportunities when he was younger and, no long and now does not want one. Um, but I thought that was really cool. We had something to connect with. Um, like me, uh, she was inspired like her brother to go work with deaf kids so I thought that was really cool. And then she also uh, wants to become an administrator, so she wants to get, as she says, get away from the kidney bean desk and go up to the big girl desk and do more for these kids than just teach them how to speech. Give them opportunities that they can have um, all through their grades, all through grades and all through school, um, and really help them. So I thought that was really cool. So I thought I'd introduce y'all to my mentor. This is my mentor, Miss Amanda England. Um, she's so passionate about what she does. She graduated only about two years ago um, from UTD and she's like loves she's amazing um, she's really good at making any situation into a learning opportunity she can change a classroom in a blink of an eye um, it's really it's really awesome to watch her deal with some interesting situations um, and her goal is to help as many can, kids as she can and she takes on new students every year she has is one of the at the school she has one of the largest groups um, of, of students that she sees, so I thought that was really interesting. 
So some highlights of my mentorship. I've um, been able to observe a good variety of speech sessions. I've seen kids throw themselves on the floor and refuse to do any work that day because they are tired and do not want to do anything. And then I've seen sessions where things have gone amazing. I've been able to see children have these pro have progress in their articulation and all of these really great things. So it's really cool to that I've seen such a good mix of things. And I've also sat on in a lot of art meetings. Um, I will explain what an art is in a minute, but that's just like the special, special education um, meeting within parents. There are um, parents, teachers, deaf education teachers, speech language pathologists, and uh, directors of the program that are in these meetings. And it's really interesting to watch the parents, um, how they like deal with their kids or how interested they are with their kids because there are amazing parents out there that will do absolutely anything for their kid and are, will do speech at home. And then there are parents that refuse to learn sign language to communicate with their kids. So I think it's interesting to see that mix. So I thought I would talk about my original work. So some things that I wanted to get out of my original work is I wanted to learn what the ARD process was or the Admission Review Dismissal Program. And then I also wanted to learn what an IEP or an individual education plan was and how to create those goals that are in the IEP and then how to create lesson plans to help those students reach those goals. So for my original work, I created two students. Um, I, Flynn Ryder and Charlotte Frog, those are what I decided I would name them. Um, and I created those, they were both two students with different levels and different um, learning styles and learn how to mix them together. So I created an IEP sheet for both of them and I created eight speech sessions were um, planned so to reach those students' goals. So this is an example of the IEP I created, but an, I thought I would tell y'all that an ARD is a meeting um, that determines the special education support and services a student gets and that's very typical. There's a lot of people that are involved in ARD meetings and it's kind of a big thing. It's usually about an hour meeting. And then an IEP is the plan or the program designed for that student. So this is an example of my IEP. So at the very top, you can see that I just have basic information about the student. Then you give, usually write about a paragraph about the student, like what grade they are, some of their favorite things, some strengths. So any person who was reading this uh, would kind of get to know the student. Um, and then next you can see there is the areas of strength and the areas of need. And so for every area of strength, that's basically like what they've already mastered, you will have um, an area of need. So for example, um, they're able to identify, oh my gosh, I can't read that. Um, it's like size, like say this is this big, and then be able to, so that's an area that they've already mastered. And then for the other side, it would be um, pronouncing the KGs and NG ending sounds. So you just have it. You just need to balance them out, and so if you have four areas of strength, you usually have four areas of need. And then you create the goals. So for creating a goal, you would um, always give a time period, so like six therapy sessions, and then instead of, you can't be perfect every time, so they would try to say these things seven out of ten times, or six out of ten. Usually it's six out of eight um, are the usual range because you can't be perfect, and you can't expect these children to be perfect every time. So. Six out of eight is usually the range that um, most people, most speech pathologists will set their goals at. And then this is an example of a lesson plan. So a typical lesson plan is about 30 to 40 minutes, as I said. So when you walk in, you'll be, um, the speech pathologist will be checking um, the student's equipment, they'll be checking the ling sounds, and the ling sounds is just a really fast and easy way to test all the frequencies of the hearing aid. Uh, so there's the a, u, e, sh, Mm -hmm. So as you can hear, I have a complete, uh, like a whole range of different frequencies that I'm using. Um, so it's just a really easy way to make sure your equipment's working all the way and that nothing's like going wrong. And then you usually have about two activities. So one's usually articulation and articulation is just sounds um, that they're having issues with and then other goals. These goals can include like following directions or uh, using self-advocacy skills because a lot of kids um, don't want to say, oh, my equipment's broken. So that's usually a really big goal for younger kids because they don't allow, let the teachers like even know that their batteries ran out or that their coils failed. So that's usually a big goal for young kids. And then, so I thought I'd move on to my final product. So for my final product, I wanted to focus on these three big concepts that most deaf students have to work on. And that's articulation, building language, and phonological processes. And then I also wanted to learn how to properly conduct a speech session. And I wanted to incorporate the skills from my original work. I really enjoyed 
working on my original work. I loved making lesson plans and finding activities that would um, work with the students and work with their needs. So I thought that I wanted to do something like my original work, but at a bigger level. So I created, so I created one binder, but it has three different sections. The first section is articulation, and articulation is just the process by which sound syllabuses and words are formed. So some common sounds that most deaf kids have problems with are the K's, the G's, the F's, the V's, and the S's. Those are usually more high frequency sounds. So I, as you can see, I have a cookie jar right there, and then I have up the cut out example. So if you're in a speech session, and you have a group of kids, every student would have the sound that they're working on. So in this case, they're working on K's, the K initial sounds. So you have your cookie jar and you have your cookies and you would give the student um, your cookie jar and your cookies and every time they say the word correctly, they get to put it in the cookie jar. So that's just a really fun uh, activity that usually would take about five to 10 minutes uh, with a big group of students. But most kids really love putting things into the, this they love this kind of stuff. And it's really easy, it's not too hard, not too time consuming, and is focusing on things that they need to be working on, which is articulation and sounds. So I think that's a really fun activity. And then another area of my binder is building language. So every child has issues with this. This isn't just like a deaf education thing. This is every kid uh, needs to work on their language. So for example, these are like the nouns, the verbs, the pronouns, the prepositions. Um, for some reason, deaf kids have a really hard time grasping the whole concept of um, like nouns and prepositions. It just takes them a lot, a little bit of extra practice. So this is a thing that happens a lot in speech. They usually work on this kind of stuff. So I have an example of the activity that I created for this one. So it's a little speech flip book and it has nouns. So it says like, oh my gosh, a noun is a person, place, or thing. It has examples and little pictures. And then you would have a place to write your own examples for the students. So this is more focused towards like second graders and third graders. Kindergartners and first graders would not be very interested in this. You usually have to play games and be very fast and this is more of a slow activity. So this is definitely focused more towards the older students. And then phonological processes. So phono there's about 22 different phonological processes but a phonological process is basically just a simplification of the sound. Um, as I said, there's 22 different processes, but I just focused on three. So final consonant is just when you leave the last consonant off of the word. So for example, instead of saying toad, someone, the child might say toe because they aren't able to say that. It's um, not something that they notice. It's more of a mental thing. They don't even realize they're saying it like 90% of the time. It just kind of happens with um, just some issues of uh, communication. And then stopping is when a high frequency word like F or S is substituted with a low frequency word like um, with a P or a D. So for example, instead of saying fan, the child might say pan. And then a cluster reduction is when a consonant cluster is reduced to a single consonant. So instead of saying plane, they say pain. So pan, whoops, I don't know, anyways. Um, so I have my example for this one. Oh, so it, and it's another, um, like they put it into so they're basically feeding the frog with these flies. So they have, uh, these flies have little pictures on them of all the different words. They're working on their P final consonant sounds. So there's like a soda, tape, shape, are all in here and then they'll feed the frog. Um, so it's just an easy activity. These are more focused towards the younger kids, like kindergartners and first graders. Um, it can be used for older kids, but you would have to use more difficult words. But it's just a very cute and easy activity that can be done um, with, the children. And then um, next week I'm actually conducting a speech session with a small group of third graders. So my mentor will look through my binder and randomly pick out a few activities and then I will have to teach them and work on them with the kids, which is going to be really, really fun. I'm a little nervous, but I will have to go through the whole process of checking um, their FM systems, which is a, um, it's basically like a microphone so you can hear directly to the teacher's mouth. The teacher wears a mic. so. In this case, I'd be wearing a mic and then the, my voice would go straight to their implants, which is kind of cool. So I'll be checking uh, their FM systems, I'll be checking the Ling sounds, I'll do the whole warm up with them. And then I'll have to teach three random activities and then I'll be creating an evaluation sheet for my mentor to see what I did wrong, what I did right, uh, what I, how I can improve, um, and things like that. So that's the next big step of my speech, um, of my 
um, final product and then that's actually the last part of that and hopefully I will get a few pictures of that. I asked if I could record the session so I could like show in my final presentations but um, due to school laws that was not okay with um, the principals. And then what I have learned from my final product, so I learned that there's a lot of prepara preparation for speech classes. There's a lot of cutting things out and finding uh, good activities for the kids that aren't really boring. There is um, a lot, you really need to be organized if you wanna go, because uh, every speech session is about five minutes apart, so you really need to be able to keep going and be really, really organized. 